Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Towards the end of 2024, astronomers announced that they had captured the first ever close-up image of a star beyond our galaxy. This episode, I got the chance to speak to Jaco van Loon, part of the team that achieved this remarkable feat, to find out more. I'm Jaco van Loon. I'm an astronomer at Keele University. And uh, the things I've been studying are everything that happens inside galaxies that makes galaxies change. And one of the things that makes galaxies change is the death of stars. So um, what we're going to talk about now is, is one of such processes. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's, it's great to have you here. And as you say, we're talking about the death of the death of stars, but we're talking about a particular star, aren't we? Because back in towards the end of 2024, you were involved in quite an amazing first, quite an amazing um, achievement. I was hoping you could, we could just kick off by you, you telling us about that. Yeah, so we were studying this star, but it is quite quite far away. It's in another galaxy, so uh, it it always looks like just a, a speck of light, just like what you would see when you look up at the night sky. But it's a very unusual star, so we really wanted to 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 image it. And earlier, uh, my colleague had um, uh, used a special technique to find out if this object uh, was extended um, but wasn't an image so now with a better technology we could actually take an image of this star it took a few years to process that and so we've just published it in 2024 and it's it's amazing it's worked yeah the star is at uh, g 64 and as i understand it this is the first ever time that anyone's been able to capture a zoomed in view of a a star beyond our galaxy. Just how big an achievement is that in itself? Yeah, so this is 160,000 light years away. To to, to image anything uh, at, at or near a star is, is impossible with a normal photograph. So you, you have to use a special technique called interferometry, where you place telescopes further apart to mimic a much larger telescope. But, but the object has to be bright enough. So WHG64 was the best um, star to try this on. Uh, because it's luminous and it's also big. So even though it's very far away, we would have a chance to actually see it on the image as an extended uh, object. Uh, and that paid off because it, it works. But there are not many such objects that we could have tried. Uh, we could have tried some objects in the Milky Way galaxy. But um, again, stars like WH-64 are very rare. Um, so often you have to look in other galaxies to find such stars. What sort of star is it? So this is a, a red supergiant, or or at least because it's changing, it, it was a red supergiant, uh, very luminous, um, very cool star, and um, th these stars are massive stars that are on their way to dying. So it's 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 their last um, maybe ten percent or less of their lifetime that they spend as a red supergiant, and then they are expected to explode as a supernova. And so this has been seen in in the past. So this is one of the reasons why we are particularly interested in these red supergiants because they're so close to dying, and in fact they are already dying because they're already blowing their outer layers into space. And so this is a process that is important for you know, the, the surroundings of such stars. Is the star, or was the star, similar to our sun? And does, and does this therefore show us what, what will happen to our sun? Uh, no, our sun is uh, quite a, an ordinary star, really. It's, it's not massive as such, and it will never um, explode as a, as a you know, um, supernova. It will become a red giant star, though. It will uh, blow it up and become very large, um, possibly about the size of the orbit of the Earth. But that's still nothing compared to this, uh, this red supergiant, WHG64, which is... Um, probably um, a, a few thousand times the size of the sun now. And even when the sun is a red giant star, the BST-64 is still 10 times as large as that. So it actually encompasses the orbit of Jupiter even. Wow, that's incredible. As I understand it, you've personally have been studying this star for quite a while, haven't you? I, I think is it since the 90s you, you, you personally have been looking at this star? Yes, yeah. So um, when I started my PhD, as a student in, in the, the second half of the 1990s, one of the first things I, I, I did was uh, go to Chile 
and use a, a radio telescope at high frequency to, to study um, what are called radio lasers or masers. Uh, and this was uh, one of the targets, the best one, and um, I, I detected um, uh, such laser, a, a silicon monoxide laser. Uh, it was never seen in another galaxy before. Um, so I really got hooked on this star, and um, I've been studying it ever since, really. Um, by then, this was already known to be a very luminous and very dusty red supergiant star. But since then, we have uh, learned a lot more about what actually uh, the shape of the, the distribution of matter is around this star. And also we have realized that uh, probably this star is not alone. So over time, you, know, you, you build a picture, even <laughs> though we didn't have a picture, um, now we do have a picture, but you do build a picture from different observations and what happens over time. Um, this star was um, uh, first uh, noticed in um, the late 1970s and uh, published in 1981, and that's where the name comes from. Uh, w stands for Westerlund, O for Olander, and H for Hayden. Those were the, the people that published it. And, and G stands for giants. At that time, it, it looked like just an ordinary giant star. So when you ask, no, is this a star like the sun or like what the sun would become? Um, at the time, they thought it was. It was only with the infrared astronomical satellites that flew into space in the early 1980s um, that a lot of infrared emission was uh, picked up from this star. And it, and it turned out it was a lot more luminous than, than first thought. And so it was uh, the most luminous red supergiant, in fact. It's amazing that, that, you know, when you first start looking at something, you know, in the 70s and then in the 90s, it's almost like the universe, we have to wait for technology to, to catch up with what the universe can show us? <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, over the last hundred years, you know, we've developed so many different te techniques from radio astronomy and infrared astronomy through X-rays and gamma rays in, in, with telescopes in space, special techniques. Now we can detect gravitational waves, neutrinos. So all of these open new views of the universe. And so all of those uh, lead to discoveries and, and new insights. Almost everything we know about space has been discovered in the, in the last century. And this will continue. And so uh, now over my lifetime already, you know, we've gone through quite a lot of these technological advancements, uh, as well as just, just gathering data and uh, uh, learning better how to combine the data to find out more about uh, stars that we have known for a while already. And uh, in the case of these massive stars, they can actually change uh, relatively uh, quickly. Um, and um, we, we are actually seeing that uh, during just the generations, just a, just the lifetime of an astronomer. Yeah, that, I mean, that in itself is amazing that you can actually see things change within the, the span of, it, of a human life. But how often do you get the chance to, to go back and, and do more observations? Because presumably, the European Southern Observatory, lots of astronomers around the world want time using their, their telescopes. How, how easy is it for you to go back and, and look at an object again and again? Yeah, so doing science is, is, is competitive. And uh, although we've got loads of telescopes, uh, people cannot use the same telescope at the same time. So um, you, you have to make proposals. You have to suggest what to do and, and why. And uh, um, no, others might have better ideas. So, but of course, it is, this is an important star, and especially what's happening now and what we're seeing now. Uh, we're fairly confident that we, or, and uh, as well as other groups, uh, will we'll use telescopes uh, around the world in the, in the Southern Hemisphere when they can observe this star to find out more and, and, and um, especially how, how the, the star is going to change further. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite positive that we'll get uh, more information um, in the coming years. Let's talk about the, the image itself that was released, this first ever zoomed in image of a star beyond our galaxy. When we look at the image, what are we actually seeing? I was wondering if you could just talk us through what, what the image actually shows, because there's obviously the main bright point of light and the sort of almost oblong shape, but then there's, there's different different streaks of light around it too. Yeah, the image looks quite co complex and um, you have to understand a little bit about what, what this image actually is, because when we use uh, this kind of uh, telescope arrangement, we, we do not instantly get a picture like you would uh, take with a camera. 
So what we do is we combine different telescopes and we combine the light and then uh, we have to process uh, those data before we can actually reconstruct an image from it. Now what we see in the middle, that oblong uh, blob of light, uh, we're very confident about um, that and, it, and its, its shape and size. And um, th this is uh, um, at infrared wavelengths and we're fairly certain that what we're seeing is hot dust that has been produced by the star possibly in the last 10 or 15 years or so. But surrounding it, there are some other structures we're a little bit less confident about because of the way the image has been reconstructed. But around uh, the, the elongated blob um, are what looks like arcs or, or you know, segments of a ring structure. And uh, this, this could be the illuminated inside of a, of a larger envelope because we do know that there's a lot more gas and dust that was ejected by the star in the past that, that's hanging around at, at larger distances. But this is something that we are, we are hoping to confirm. Unfortunately, the star is actually becoming fainter and so it's, it's harder to, to do these observations again. So we're looking actually forward to an upgrade, which allows us to use a different instrument with ease and, and, and get, uh, get more information in the next uh, two years or so. Is the star becoming fainter because it's dying or is there something else that's causing that dimming? So we're not actually certain what's, what's happening because the fading of the star can be for two reasons. One is that it could be obscured by the, the fresh dust, uh, and this is a very real possibility. But it could also be that the star itself is fading. As I mentioned, it has a companion star, a hotter star, that, that has not been seen directly before. Uh, but at the moment, what we are seeing is a, a hot star. Uh, now, whether that is that companion star or uh, WHG64 that's changed into a, a, a hot star is not entirely certain. Because um, one thing that can happen to red supergiants is that instead of exploding, they, they implode and so they will just fade away quickly from sight. Seems a little bit less likely because it was accompanied by some ejected material. Uh, but this is a possibility that we've just lost our beloved star and are just left with a companion star. In terms of the, the sort of surprises that you discovered uh, with this latest round of observations, I read that there was also something interesting in the paper mentioned about the, the dusty cocoon, that the, the shape of it was, was, was unexpected. So the, um, the dusty cocoon is, is not round. It, it wasn't unexpected because um, uh, there, there have been indications uh, since um, um, the 1990s that um, uh, the distribution of material around the star is, is not distributed evenly. So it seems to be, we, we, we seem to have been looking through a hole until recently, uh, but, but now that, that seems to be filled with, with dust, which might be obscuring the star again. Now, there can be different reasons for why, why uh, the distribution is, is, is so elongated or, or flattened. One of the most popular ones is always uh, that uh, there could be a binary uh, companion star which is pulling at it. And because in this case we do know that uh, there has been a hot companion star, that's very likely to, to be the reason or at least part of the reason why the material is distributed in, in this way. That uh, dimming you mentioned, certainly for me and I'm sure lots of listeners, it brings to mind the the, the dimming events at Betelgeuse a few years ago. Is, is, is it a similar sort of thing? Yeah, so Betelgeuse, of course, it's um, got a lot of publicity because it's a star that you can see with a naked eye in the sky. It is a red supergiant. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the nearest and it's expected to explode at some point as well. But it's not a very extreme uh, version of red supergiant, so there, there's no indication that that's actually very close to exploding. But then it was seen to dim. Now, red supergiants like Betelgeuse, they're always vary in brightness a little bit, uh, but this was a, a more a more exceptional dimming than was seen before. It's explained by um, the formation of, of some fresh dust, um, but locally above a cool spot on the surface of, of the star. This is probably something that Betelgeuse is doing um, all of the time. Uh, every few decades probably will do something like that. But if it happens on the other side, we wouldn't see it. So um, while well, first there was a lot of uh, excitement about this, it's actually probably quite a, a normal phenomenon and, um, and not terribly um, dramatic for, for Betelgeuse. It, it doesn't suggest that, that there's anything 
really happening with Beetlejuice itself. So in that sense, it's it's quite different from this much more extreme, much dustier, uh, much cooler also and luminous uh, Red Supergiant WHG64. And given that WHG64 uh, is, as we as you said, 160,000 light years away, we're obviously seeing it as it existed 160,000 years ago. Does that mean that it's likely that it might already have exploded, but we just we haven't seen that yet? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. So um, uh, we've just seen the picture um, having traveled on a 60,000 years uh, in our direction. And um, we, we don't know when, when this star is going to explode. It can be soon, within years, um, or, or it can still take thousands of years. We have got other examples of uh, stars that have blown up as a supernova that have been a red supergiant before and has taken thousands of years before it exploded. We've also examples where, where stars have shown outbursts uh, just in the days, um, the years or decades before explosion. But probably it has exploded by now, and uh, that ex explosion essentially is on its way to be detected uh, from Earth at some point. I love that, that fact that when you look into the night sky, you're essentially looking back in time, aren't you? Yes. No, you you look up, you see these points of light, um, and, and that's all you see. But um, we, we now know that these stars are very far away. Uh, even the ones uh, close to the sun are years away as the light travels. Um, and then when you go to the Southern Hemisphere, you can see this neighboring galaxy in which uh, WHG64 lives, uh, with the naked eye as a, as a fuzzy a little cloud. And uh, now knowing that there's actually a, is, is a different galaxy 160,000 light years away is, is, is quite astonishing. And so the fact that with, with telescopes, we can see so much detail there. What we've seen with this, this image is, is the equivalent of uh, an astronaut walking on the moon's surface. Yes, yes, I see what you mean. What about the future then? I mean, have you applied for any more time to observe the star? Or would you like to go back and, and look at it in another few years and, and see what's happening? So we're actually taking spectra, so to, to analyze basically the temperature and, and you know, the type of star that it is with the Southern African Large Telescope. So we have had our first spectrum in, which is very interesting. It does suggest that it's, it's probably dust that is uh, dimming the star, but it's, uh, it, it could still be quite a, a cool star in that system. So we're waiting for, for new spectra to see how that is going to change. So this is one thing we're doing, and we have some ideas uh, for other type of observations um, that, that uh, look at the distribution and, and uh, the, the speed of the material around the star with radio telescopes first, and in a few years' time with the upgraded uh, interferometer, uh, we're hoping to observe this object again in the infrared and uh, see how it's changed, but also get a, get a better picture overall and see how the dust is distributed. And hopefully we can reconstruct what has happened over the last uh, 10, 20 years with this system, as well as seeing what's left after this episode. Amazing. I mean, even just talking to you over the past 20 minutes about it, I can see why you and your colleagues are, are dedicating so much time to this, because it, it is absolutely fascinating. And it's, a, it's an insight into the workings of the cosmos, I suppose. And it's, it's just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, so this is one star, and sometimes just you learn a lot from just studying one star uh, very closely uh, in a lot of detail. Uh, in other cases, we are studying many stars and, and see how they compare and how they differ. So uh, with all these different types of observations, uh, we, we're learning how stars live and die. And these are massive stars, but we do the same with stars uh, like the Sun. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast, Shaco, and, and sharing your observations and, and explaining this incredible first. And I hope, you know, in the future, when your next paper is out and the next discovery is made, maybe we'll, we'll uh, chat again. Yeah, let's hope it explodes. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine, which was edited by Lewis Dobbs. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes, or your favorite podcast player. <laughs>